I was once a lawyer. I was a criminal lawyer. I represented a number of notorious criminals. I also developed a $2,000 a week cocaine habit. My marriage broke down and I was sent to jail for concealing knowledge of a rather large importation of drugs. Before I was a lawyer, I was a priest. And before I was a priest, I was a soldier. In fact, I've been about 10 different soldiers. I've been a policeman, uh, about, about four policemen, I think. I've been a skinhead. I was God. <laughs> Only once. I've been married more times than Elizabeth Taylor. And I've been a father to more kids than I can remember. My name is David, and I'm an actor. What is acting? Why do I do it? What's the purpose of it? Why would someone want to spend their entire life essentially trying to become someone else? Well, from when I was very young, I've always loved to make people laugh. You know, putting on silly walks or ridiculous voices, shoving things up my nose, whether that be pretzels or carrots or frankfurts pulling my pants way above my waist up to my chest to transform into hairy high pants, <laughs> or by doing the opposite by pulling them way down here towards my knees to transform into Larry low pants. <laughs> you know, simple comic techniques almost always guaranteed to get a chuckle. But as time went on, my inclination to make people laugh began to grow into something else, acting. Now, the best definition of acting that I've come across is from acting teacher Sanford Meisner, who said, acting is behaving truthfully in an imaginary situation. Behaving truthfully in an imaginary situation. Now, an early performance that I can pinpoint as an indication that my motivation to act was more than just a desire to make people laugh was a school performance of Shakespeare's Henry IV, part one. I was cast in the wonderful role of Hotspur, the courageous, impetuous leader with a hot head. And before each of the performances, the three performances, I found a quiet spot behind the lecture theatre next to a large old oak tree. And I'd have my wooden sword and I'd wave my wooden sword vigorously towards the defenceless oak tree. And I'd swing my arm so vigorously that my breathing would increase and I'd nearly hyperventilate. But importantly, while I was waving my wooden sword and nearly hyperventilating, I was also beginning to visualize exactly what my character was about to describe, which was the end of a very long, bloody battle. And indeed, when the time came for me to burst through the theatre doors as Hotspur, I was in a sufficient state of mind to be able to accurately recall the horrors. I'd psyched myself so that I could behave as truthfully as possible as Hotspur in an imaginary situation, which was the lecture theatre, posing as the King's Court in London. Now, I was only 12, I hadn't yet been to acting school, but without Without consciously thinking about it, I was instinctively utilising an acting technique. Now, there's many different variations of this technique. One that some people have heard of is the method or method acting. Now, there's many other techniques too. After I finally did graduate from acting school, one of the first plays that I performed in was a beautiful play by Dennis Potter called Blue Remembered Hills. It's about a group of seven-year-olds who play together in a forest one afternoon in the north of England. And all the seven-year-olds are played by adult actors. Now, hours before each of the performances, I'd go to a very rough brick wall near the theatre and I would bash my elbows and my knees against the rough brick wall. And then I'd scrape my knees and my elbows against a cement pavement causing numerous scabs to occur. 
And then later that night in the theatre, in very close proximity to the audience, as Willie, my character, I'd begin to pick my scabs. And little bits of flaky scab (laughs) would fall to the floor. Some big crusty bits had become embedded under my fingernails. And sometimes even a little trickle of blood had run down my elbows or down my knees. And in this way, I was using an external technique to allow me to get into the mind of a seven-year-old and behave truthfully. Now that's just a little snapshot of a couple of different ways of how acting may be approached. But why do I do it? And what's the purpose of it? Well, actors throughout history are essentially storytellers. And through stories, we share our passions, our dreams, our heartaches, our heartbreaks, our sorrows, and our joys. Stories are universal. They help us understand ourselves better and find commonality with others. Now, some of the stories that I've been fortunate enough to have been involved in telling have been based on real people and real events. And some of these stories have had reverberations that have continued to ripple long after the final credits have rolled. The significance of the simple act of storytelling has been healing, for some, and inspirational for others. Now, the clearest example I can give of this is a little-known film that I did called Molokai. It's the story of a Belgian priest, Damien, who volunteered to go to Molokai, which is an island in Hawaii in the 19th century, and work with leprosy patients. Now, at the time, anybody who was even suspected of having leprosy was sent to Molokai essentially to rot and to die. But Damien volunteered to go to Molokai, and he went, and he built the people houses. He constructed a sewerage system. He organized schools. He taught music. And because of him, that community became a place to live rather than to die. I played Damien. The film was shot on location in 1999. At the time, the government had long stopped sending sufferers of leprosy to Molokai. However, there were still 55 patients, as they referred to themselves, who were still living there. Now, myself and the director, Paul Cox, lived with them in their community for five months. And up until that point, cameras of any description had been banned in the community. But Paul, slowly started to gain the confidence of the people. And one by one, the patients came to Paul and offered to put themselves on screen in the film so people could see what this horrendous disease does to a body and a face. And Paul tweaked the writing of many of the scenes so I, as Father Damien, was working with these people and acting and reacting to people who had truly lived the same story we were telling. And these were my favorite scenes, where I found it easy to behave truthfully. Now, a year after the film was completed, Paul and I returned to Molokai to screen the film for the patients. Now, there was nowhere physically in the community to actually screen the film, so an arrangement was made to fly each of the patients to what was known as topside of the island. Now, it's a short flight, about eight to 10 minutes. And two small aircraft made numerous trips. And each of the patients were either assisted or carried on and off the aircraft at each end. And a makeshift screen was erected in a community hall and the film was screened. These people had never seen themselves on the screen before, let alone even a photograph of themselves. And yet here they were on screen telling not only their story, but the story of generations before them. Now, needless to say, there were numerous tears after that screening. Some tears of sadness, but overwhelmingly, they were tears of pride and joy. They were proud to have been involved in telling such an important story of their history 
and their culture. And I felt privileged to have been part of their storytelling. That's why I'm an actor. Stories can change us. Stories can change our outlook. Stories can change our thoughts. Stories can change our mood. Stories can change our opinions. And sometimes, a story is a little ahead of its time. In 2001, well before the global financial crisis and well before the Banking Royal Commission, I was in a film called The Bank. I played Jim Doyle, who was a loyal bank employee, and he was also a computer and mathematical genius. But Jim, surprise, surprise, he uncovered corruption within the bank. Now, the head of the bank found out that Jim knew, and Jim then was immediately fired. But Jim, being the computer and mathematical genius that he was, he embedded a virus into the bank's computer system that affected every one of the bank's trades. And ultimately, Jim succeeded in bringing down the entire bank. And when he was asked why he did this, Jim just coolly res responded, I just hate banks. <laughs> Sometimes it feels really good to tell a story. It's cathartic. <laughs> I'm an actor. Why? Because I love to tell stories. Stories make us human. Thank you. <laughs>